All right. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Vikram Deal. I'm super pumped to be here with one of my really good buddies. Uh, Bryson is super dope. I actually met him through Tony Robbins about two years ago. He was my roommate. Um, I think I had to change rooms like three times, and then we finally <laughs> we linked up. And I was like, all right, now I see why the, why the world or the universe made me change rooms so much. Um, you know, the guy was born in Texas. He was a special op, airborne ranger in the Army. So thank you for your service. He gave uh, – he did a lot of deployment overseas, which I think um, that kind of helps me see some of the discipline that he has, some of the organization he has, the way that his brain works. Um, he went to the University of Texas in San Antonio, and then he got into real estate, which was another thing that him and I really jived on because when I had met him, I was kind of in in real estate and kind of out of real estate, so it was nice to – to be able to touch base with him. He's been doing real estate, I think you said 15 years, give or take. So, yeah. So basically Since, he's uh, getting 2015 his, or yeah. um, 2005, I mean. Yeah, so if you're looking for a shitty buyer's agent that doesn't know how to fill out a form, you probably don't want to call him because he knows exactly <laughs> what he's doing. Um, he loves uncertainty and he loves growth. I think that's one of the reasons why we really connect and I hope we can dive into that, um, but Outside of real estate, you jumped into the world of cryptocurrency, you're into technology stuff, you're into learning, um, you do a lot of charity work, you do a lot of things that, you, you do a lot of service work and things that give back. Uh, but, you know, outside of the bio that you emailed me or texted me the other day that I was reading off of, tell me who you are. Tell me, tell me kind of a little bit about you and... Uh, what makes you tick? What makes you do the things that you do? I mean, really, you know, like we we're talking about offline, I kind of want to know the deep, dark secrets that you really don't want to <laughs> tell anybody that you have hid it in your closet that you just never really felt like sharing with the world. Uh, maybe because of fear, maybe because of embarrassment, maybe because of both. Um, maybe you've already shared them because you've done the Tony Robbins platinum adventure. So you maybe you already shared all your deep, dark secrets. So now we have to find a new one, but tell me about yourself, brother. Yeah, let me, um, let me, I guess, start by saying, you know, I'm, I, I'm just a guy. And uh, I think uh, I look for uncertainty, like you said, every day. I didn't really realize that uncertainty was such a big driving force for me. Um, it took, it probably took the Tony Robbins, you know, experience to, to have that articulated to me. So I could kind of go through my needs analysis for, you know, what my order is, at what intensity I need to experience these needs. And, and so I really found out that uh, uncertainty and, and growth were really high for me. And I never really gave myself credit for, you know, having those two needs really at all, just because until they're articulated to you, you know, whether it's through that organization or any other, you know, you really, you really kind of don't know what you need in life. You just kind of go trial and error. <laughs> so, um, I found that uh, that that was a big one for me, and um, growth, you know, became very evident as well. Um, and honestly, that experience just taught me a whole lot. So that was probably the most naked I, I ever was, you know, metaphorically speaking. Was uh, my first event was a date with destiny event, oh, wow. and uh, it it was um, probably what day four I think is relationships day. And so relationships day, you know, I had uh, literally my first event, I ended up having a couple hour intervention with Tony Robbins. And we, you know, literally like exposed, I guess you could say, you know, all my secrets and, and just the things that I would otherwise be, you know, averse to talking about <laughs> in front right. of, you know, a lot of people, but so it was in about, front of 3,000 or 4,000 of your closest yeah. friends that you've never met in a uh, right. auditorium while there's 36 cameras recording everything you say. <laughs> right, right. After I've signed my waiver saying that it can be used, you know, <laughs> however, whenever. On uh, all of his the, new virtual podcasts and right, platforms. In the future. Yeah, yep. Yep, exactly. So, so that was um, my icebreaker really into that world. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I feel like there's there's a new most challenging experience, you know, that you have to go through every couple of years, maybe at least every five years, especially if you're seeking growth. You know, if, if you're seeking comfort and you're seeking, you know, consistency and routine, 
then you probably don't have to go through, you know, the challenge of, of uncertainty and, and just a, a new scary thing, so to speak, every two, three, five years. But I've found that um, I think when you're chasing growth and uncertainty is just something that really drives you, that you end up, you know, pushing yourself to experience these things. And so in 2016, for me, it was relationships. And then I went into, you know, Platinum Partnership and, you know, we met and uh, I engaged in, you know, a, a few different investments and, and just you have that empowered mindset, like, you know, you might as well just do it. And so you go all out. And I think that's what happened. You know, that's what happened to me um, in, in a couple different places. I went a little more all out than I would have <laughs> into investments, expansion. I went into uh, an e-commerce business. And I launched, you know, an, an e-commerce business at, at an extremely high level for a guy with zero, you know, e-commerce experience. And so I invested and uh, what was really interesting was probably somewhere in 2018, you know, I had a, I had just a massive uh, financial psychological, you know, challenge that, that I had to get through. And, uh, so it was, you know, no longer was relationships my challenge, but I had pushed myself so far into expansion, growth, business, finance, you know, um, leveraging, you know, every, every uh, asset that I had as far as like, not speaking, you know, as far as like mortgaging the house or anything like that, but, you know, leveraging like every psychological asset that I had to, to grow into this person that, that uh, I was challenging myself to become particularly, you know, uh, with launching into e-commerce, launching into, I think that was the same time frame, 16, 17, that I went heavy into cryptocurrency. So I just got hit with a bunch of stuff at the same time. And, um, you know, a lot of it was, was downward. <laughs> you know, a lot of it was investments that I, that I you know, made poor decisions on or, or just adversity that I had to overcome. Um, and looking back, I remember reading Keith Cunningham's book, The Road Less Stupid. And, and, you know, I don't know if it was in that book or just at one of, you know, the seminars, you know, where I heard him speak live. But I thought it was really interesting, you know, that uh, one of the things he challenges people to do is he's like, you know, it turns out the secret to getting rich isn't to do more smart things, you know, or stuff. It's to do less dumb stuff. And uh, I found it interesting that when I looked back at the reasons that I, that I, you know, like maybe the top three decisions that I made that lost me the most money, or if I just look back at the situations, you know, that lost me the most money, it, it really did come down to, to less than five decisions where I decided to execute on a massive level, but it was a mixture of, of you know, being overly optimistic and, and not mitigating risk. And so, you go through these things, whether it's a relationship issue, a financial issue, a business venture, investments, but you go through these things. And I think, you know, I've found that you come out of it on the other end, a year, two years, three years later, and you're just this larger person because of it. You can handle so much more. You know, there, there, was, there was just pain, psychological pain that I went through whether it was 16, you know, due to the relationship challenges or whether it was 17, 18 due to, you know, getting hit with a massive, again, I look at money very psychologically. So just massive psychological losses that, that, um, that affect you. And, you know, once you've been through them though, if I got hit with the same thing in 2022, it would have to be on a different level or else I wouldn't feel the same pain. I'd be like, well, I already had that happen and I was okay. Well, so, if, it, if adversity doesn't kill you or break you, it grows you. 100%. If you, if you don't have adversity in life. I mean, people like to think about things in such a large level, but I say, let's just bring it back to when we were kids, mm -hmm. right? The first time you learned to crawl or walk or roll over, right? There's so much adversity. It seems so simple to an adult because we've been doing it for 40, 30, 20 years. Um, yeah. but the adversity kind of is what makes us who we are. Um, I want, I want to go back to a, a concept and I know, I know you've heard the concept before, but, um, maybe it's phrased a little bit differently. So we have what we call upper level limits, 
So mm -hmm. we have these upper level limits. So for me, I'll give you an example. Like right now, I've been really focused on health and wellness and my body, um, you know, looks wise, obviously for the ego, but also just performance wise. And I noticed that when I get to a certain point of aesthetics and strength, you know, I'm moving up the, the bands and the weight and this and that, I get to a certain point where my thermostat kicks in. It's like, hey, you're at an 80. You need to come back to a 72. And so yeah. then I'll start eating pizza. <clears throat> I'll start waking up a little bit later. I'll go to sleep a little bit later. And I say, oh, it's not a big deal. Not a big deal. Not a big deal. Not a big deal. I'll party a little bit more. I'll do things that bring me back down to a 65. Right. Then I look at the mirror and I'm like, or I, I get on the bike or I get out and I start exercising and I'm like, two weeks ago, I was crushing this same routine. And now I'm a <laughs> upper level limit. So our thermostat that we have is set to a certain temperature. That is where we're comfortable at anything over or below our thermostat kicks on the heater or the cooler. And it's like, Hey, we got to fix this shit. Like there's, right. there's something broken here. This, this guy is fucking broken. Like we got to heat him up. We got to cool him down. And one of the things that people try to do is they say, well, I'm going to bring in another air conditioning. Like you, we, we all know how Tony Robbins brings in thousands and thousands of thousands of, I don't know what they're called, but cooling units to his events. Cause I mean, that thing is an ice cube. Right. But our thermostat, even if we bring in extra coolers, wants to keep us at that kind of homeostasis comfortable level. So even right. if we bring in extra heaters or extra coolers, we're still going to see ourselves at that level. Until we see ourselves differently, we don't level up. And, you know, you go back to this fine. So first off, for those of you who don't know, I mean, I'm not going to ask you to pull out your, uh, your, your tax return. <laughs> My, my I, I hope you paid. I, I hope you paid less. I hope you paid less than Trump did, though, because you know that means you got a great accountant, and I might need to talk to him. Um, I do have a good accountant. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you said that there were some things that you had to. You know, I, I'm 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 interpreting. So you said there were some things with financial that you needed to level up. There were some things with relationship you needed to level up. Now you're a guy who was already relatively in the eyes of most people successful right you had a house sure. you lived in a nice house you have a you know nice backyard i'm assuming it's the same house that i've seen in <laughs> right. pictures there's a beautiful pool i think it's got some sort of a view of some stuff you know so it's yeah. a really tranquil beautiful property um you know financially you've been in real estate for at that point over a decade i i know that being in my previous life being in real estate um, if you can manage to stick it out for three to five years, you tend to do pretty well financially. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that real estate fucks you up with in your head mentally because of some of the, uh, the atrociousness of, uh, of being a realtor. But overall, I mean, it's pretty, pretty cut and dry, pretty simple, you know, crazy hours. But financially, you can definitely make some money. Why were you not fulfilled? Right? Why, why, why did you have an unfulfilled relationship in 2016? I mean, I can't imagine it was unfulfilled because money was tight. Right. Yeah, so no, it had nothing, what, to, what's it had your nothing to do with problem, that. problem, man? Why do you have all these <laughs> first world problems? Like, God damn, you get your shit together. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, um, I definitely had a different psychology and, uh, you're very right in, you know, saying that. And, and I think that's something that probably a lot of people could stand to have. And that is perspective, you know, and, and that is that it is true that even then and, and, and now, you know, most of the problems I come across on a daily basis are first world problems, you know, like, like your biggest problem is, you know, why is my thermostat for my body, you know, less than what it should be, <laughs> you know, like if that's your problem. Right. So that's a, that's a beautiful thing. So perspective has definitely, you know, come to, to help me a lot. But um, for me, you know, it was, it was actually, I think the biggest thing if I, if I could kind of like shortcut the conversation to, yeah. to what, what I really needed to hear from, you know, date with destiny, some of some of the biggest, uh, what do they call them? Breakthroughs that, right. uh, that, that I had, right. it had to do, it, it really had to do with the fact that we as human beings have, 
blueprints, you know, for, for the way that, that we think life should be. We have right. blueprints for our finances, right? Like maybe a person's blueprint is, you know, I should at least just be able to make, you know, X amount of dollars, have a house and, you know, provide for my family. And as long as I have a roof and food, that's my blueprint. And then other people, Good, right? other people have this blueprint of, you know, like if I don't at least create a new tech startup company and achieve, you know, a 10 million plus dollar exit, then I fail. Like that's my blueprint. Obviously one is way harder to meet than the other. So statistically the person with the startup blueprint is going to more than likely, you know, encounter a lot more emotional challenge. And so for me, I think at the end of the day, it had everything to do with blueprint, but more as far as like what I expected from relationship, what I expected from, you know, companionship, uh, what I expected from, uh, you know, as far as like children, stepchildren, number of children, all these things that I had created in my head subconsciously for the way that I think, you know, my relationship, anybody else's wouldn't matter, right? If you're talking about your own blueprint. So the way that I felt that my relationship should look, you know, what should it look like? What should it be like? Um, how do we treat each other? What do we do on Sundays? What do we do on Fridays? Intimacy, what does that look like? I mean, we really have expectations is kind of another word for it around what all this should look like. Right. And so, so for me, um, I was in a relationship where I had three stepchildren and, um, and that was kind of, you know, what I walked into. It was a guy that had no understanding of his blueprint and was purely meeting his match, you know, at uh, however old I was, was I probably like 20, 27, 28 years old, you know, when we met, um, purely meeting a match based on, you know, and, and I think this is a lot of people, you know, he's handsome, she's pretty, like, let's connect. And then it's usually not until, and if it even happens in the first place, it's not until six months, 12 months, or years, probably in most cases, yep. down the road that people really like, even start to on an abstract level start discussing values the rules that they have for things you know the beliefs the the you know just all these different aspects of the relationship that are so much that are so important and um, so that's essentially you know what happened to us is we had chemistry you know and everything was i think pretty strong between us but when you tied in expectations, blueprint, values, um, you know, standards, you know, picture of what life should look like now, five years from now, 10 years from now, uh, what family should look like, all of that, there was a lot of conflict. And so again, back to the DWD material for me, um, when they went over the definition of, you know, uh, what suffering is, what pain is, those, those things just very simple formula, which, you know, opened my eyes. It was just simply when your life conditions don't match your blueprint, you're in pain. Right. And that's, that's, it's like getting closer, right. To where I'm at. And it's sim it's that simple. Right. The way that I feel like my life should look is, is different than the way it is. So my life conditions did not match my blueprint. And then you've got suffering, which is when your life conditions don't match your blueprint and you don't think they ever will, or you think that you're powerless to change it. And I think, you know, a part of me was kind of feeling that. So even though my day-to-day -day life was even then, you know, beautiful when you put some perspective around it, like I had a really good life. Um, it's, it, it becomes very, very challenging when it doesn't match your blueprint. And especially when you think, you know, it's, it's perpetual and it's just going to stay that way. It create it's like Tony says, it's a very, I think it's a very, um, very harsh way to say it, but I think it's accurate. You just begin to feel dead inside. And, and I, I was fearful that that would one day be the way that I felt if I kept trending down that, down that road. So I had to change it. And that, that's really what happened for me in 2016, like December. You said something interesting. <clears throat> you said suffering is basically where you just think that you're, you're, you're never going to be able to get out of this particular situation, right? So right. pain is pain is where your ability 
you're building a house and the contractor paints it yellow instead of that beautiful gray you wanted. And now you're, uh, you know, now you're, you're pissed off because the color is wrong. So that's some pain, easy to fix. Mm -hmm. Suffering would be not saying anything to the contractor because you're scared the contractor is going to quit. And so you just suffer with that ugly, whatever color house is. <laughs> And you suffer with it because of the perpetual fears that you have around whatever the conversation might be. But I think what I think what you brought up was that that constant fear, right? People are stuck in this constant fear about things, right? They suffer because they have fear about something going on in their life that has happened in the past. Or maybe their their dad was a complete dick. And so therefore, if any male figure treats them any which way that's not like a princess or perfect, um, she's going to feel like, you know, the dad issues are coming up and that she's suffering. Or he's going to feel like, you know, if mom didn't treat him a certain way and, you know, you're in a relationship, that perpetual thing, you know, is going to keep coming. And I think that for a lot of people, for me, there, there's a lot of fear and it feels good to suffer. I like to suffer some days, dude. Like, I, I'll tell you, bro. I'll tell you some crazy shit, man. I'll tell you some crazy yeah. shit, bro. And you, yeah. I, I feel like you know me well enough now. We've been friends for three years or so. Uh, yeah. I realize that I like suffering. And I like to suffer because then I could use that as a, as a marching band to say, I fucking suffered pat me on the back you know what i did to get here you know how many you know how many mountains i had to climb up that were uphill both ways with no shoes carrying the we like to <laughs> people and and i think i'm guilty of it um but i think people enjoy having a flavor of suffering because if we go back to the upper level limits <clears throat> We don't feel like we deserve to have such a great life in all aspects of the real. Mm -hmm. And so we don't feel like we can have a great financial life and we can have a great family life and we can have a great healthy life and we can have a great emotional life and we can have a great spiritual life and we can have a great contribution part of life. We don't feel like we can have all of those things in our wheel and they all be overflowing abundantly. So then we sabotage one of them on purpose, or we'll purposely pick somebody who we know can never work, or we'll purposely go into a business which we know won't give us everything. So it gives us just enough to kind of keep us unhappy. <laughs> yeah. So that we yeah. can't, we can never get to that point because, you know, like as a kid, your, your mom maybe, or your friend will say, money is the root of all evil, or you can't have everything or you need balance in your life, or you need this, or you, like all these terms to basically keep you locked down. All these terms to keep you locked down is what, is what we live in. We live in a world where people are, per, are, are constantly being pushed down instead of being pulled up. Yeah, and so, I think a, Huh? I was just going to say, yeah, a lot of what you're saying I think is true, and, and it sounds like with regard to the parental side of it, it's almost like some of those are embedded commands. You know, they're, they're putting those into the minds of children, in this case, maybe our own minds, depending on, you know, what your parents said or what my parents said at such a young age. You know, when uh, I heard somebody saying that, you know, roughly four to six years old, your brain is like in that alpha state and it's, it's like picking up everything. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I'm really careful because I have a six year old. So I'm really careful in what I say to him. And uh, I'm just trying to almost consciously and, and purposefully, you know, give him really, really good advice. Because even if it's not really how I'm feeling that day, if I can at least, you know, put that into his subconscious permanently, then my hope is, is that's what he's going to carry forward. You know, not so much the the state of, you know, challenge or stress that, that I might have truly experienced that day. But regardless, you know, I want to share some of that with him, but I don't want him to feel that energy and pick up on that energy. So I have to, I have to take it to a place where I'm just giving him advice that that's not going to be limiting and that's going to, you know, be something 
more along the lines of inspiring abundance, you know? So instead of saying money is the root of all evil, you know, what's it, what's it, what's a kid grow up to be like when you tell him money is energy, you know, money is just a magnifier of who you really are. It makes you more of who you really are. Like, what does that kid look like when he's 30, when he was hearing that starting at six, you know? And so it's a little experiment, I guess, in, in my case, but I think that that's healthier, you know, and I think it'll build somebody with less inherent limiting beliefs for sure. Well, um, you know, parenting is something that's really, I guess it's something that I've thought a lot about because, you know, I'm 38 and a half years old, uh, almost 39. I don't have kids. I've been married. I've been divorced. <laughs> I have very loving parents, but they're loving on their terms, which is like all people are. Um, mm. So they, they were good parents. They had their issues and I have my issues and they, you know, we work through those. But one of the things that I've kind of did a deep dive in, I would say over the last couple of years is why do I have some of these, like I grew up in a, you know, never in a, in a, in a poverty situation. And yet there's all these things where people are like, dude, you're just being a bitch. And yes, I agree. There's a lot of things that I'm being a bitch on. There's a lot of things I'm being a bitch on, but there's also time that you have to, un you know, everybody's like, dude, just get over it. And I'm like, you don't get over it. You get through it. But in order to get through it, you got to have new tools because the tools that got me to where I'm at today aren't going to get me to where I want to go tomorrow. So the same truck that you use when you started your business and you're taking, you know, three or four boxes of your e-commerce stuff to the grocery, uh, to, you know, FedEx, isn't the same truck you're going to need in six months when you're selling a million dollars worth of widgets and vice versa right. with children. It's the same thing is that instead of telling your kid, no, you can't do this, sit down with your kid and treat him like an adult and be like, Hey, you know, Johnny, Instead of me saying no, which is what I want to say, I want to teach you the good and the bad of whatever you're looking at right now. So right now you're looking at picking your nose, right? Well, if you pick your nose, it's great. You get the booger out of your nose, but you might cut yourself or you might see a girl that you had a crush on and she laughs at you and then you feel subconscious, whatever. You know, you pick too hard, you get a bloody nose. You make it a habit, it gets stuck under your nail, you eat it, it tastes good, you wanna do it all the time. There's so many different things, right? <laughs> I know, don't you love my analogies? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're going, you're going there, but okay, go ahead. <laughs> but people don't teach their kids. Like, they, they coddle their kids, they do everything for their kids, they wanna give everything to their kids, and they do it, I, I, I truly believe, like in my, in my, in my house, my dad is if you need something done last minute and you don't want to do it, dude, my dad is like, <clears throat> so easy. Hey dad, can you look this up? Why aren't you doing it? Uh, I don't want to. And I, it's, uh, it's due tomorrow. What, what, what do you mean? It's, he'll forget all about lecturing you. And he'll be like, what do you mean it's due tomorrow? And he'll do the work for you. Or if there's something that needs to get done that might, you know, might not be an adult level, but might not be quite a child level. Instead of giving the kid the opportunity to go out and do it and build some confidence and build some, some mental fortitude, my dad's like, I'll just do it. I'll do it. Don't worry. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. When it comes to boys, you know, I mean, you got a six-year-old. It, it probably has kept you up a little bit at night thinking, what do I, I, I make money. I don't have necessarily the best, you know, when he was young, I didn't have the best relationship for him to, and to, to learn from. What do you want him to, you know, what do you want him to be when he's 18, 19, 20? Like what, where do you want him to start his adult life as? And um, I'm, I'm really, you know, thinking of him and, and all the different, you know, dynamics of, of raising him. Um, has definitely been a part of what I think about. Um, I have to say, you know, what, three, four years later, um, I guess almost four years later after going through that turbulence, you know, I'm, I'm pretty proud of the way that he's turning out, you know, at six years old, I just got done telling him, 
how proud, you know, I tell him a lot because I do want to build that confidence that, that I'm proud of him. Um, honestly, what keeps me up more than that, because I feel like I'm on the right track with almost like training him for the man that he's going to be one day. Um, I'm, I'm in his life, you know, every, every other week. And so he goes to his, his mom's side, you know, every other week. And, um, you know, I, I don't have any say, obviously, control and, and so forth of what goes on over there. Uh, but I know her. And so I feel like, you know, I just trust that she's going to do, you know, uh, she's going to raise him. And obviously, we had pretty good chemistry, even the way that we raised kids and stuff while we were together. So I feel like she's going to do her part the, the best she knows how. I know, I know he's going to a good, safe environment over there. But I don't know the lessons he's being taught. I don't know the outlooks he's being taught. And that was something that I shared with him and I, and, you know, and he's six. So to share this, you know, macro view of, of raising him with a six year old is kind of funny, <laughs> but I, I just flat out told him, I said, you know, I don't, I didn't know. And I, and I don't know what you do with half of your life when, when you're over there with your mom. But what I do want to say is you're a good kid and I'm really proud of, you know, the, the young man that you're growing into um, he's in Spanish immersion, so he's starting to speak Spanish. Um, his uh, school, you know, had him on the announcements for, you know, something that he did just above and beyond from a scholastic point of view. And uh, th those were all the things, at least at six years old, that, that I would have hoped that we would accomplish. You know, I, I would hope that he'd just be doing well, tracking, um, and not emotionally distraught or challenged you know having massive problems from issues stemming from having a divided family you know all the things that you know you would think of that that might accompany this type of situation so that's kind of where we're at um i i teach him like i said a lot of philosophy that's that's probably not super relevant to a six-year-old but i'm trying to put it into his subconscious and and i i think you know i just want him to be in a position at 18 years old to to make better decisions than what I was capable of at 18 years old because <laughs> I, I I you know I don't know you know we've not never maybe talked about this but I had a bad peer group I had negative influences in my peer group you know I didn't place a lot of importance on school grades being present <laughs> you know, going to school um, you know, I, I literally like had it figured out to where I would skip the maximum amount of classes possible and yet still, you know, be able to make up for it through Saturday schools. Um, if I graduated, you know, I didn't really care that it was with like a high D or, you know, whatever, yeah. the, grade, whatever the grade was, like it wasn't important to me. And it wasn't that I wasn't I, capable. My report card looked more like a disc assessment than a report card. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It just, it wasn't, it wasn't super important. So um, that's who I was, you know, I think uh, back then, and my parents tried their best with the tools that they had. Um, but I think that I'm kind of arming him very early, you know, um, that decisions that you make, you know, even micro decisions on a daily basis train you to make macro decisions. And I tell him that my hope is, is that if I've done my job right at 18 years old, you know, eventually you'll be able to make your own decisions. But when you're starting to practice as a young adult, whether it's 15, 16, 17, 18, you know, maybe through early 20s, you know, that you haven't really had a lot of practice making macro decisions. You definitely still have some mistakes ahead of you, but maybe you'll, because you respect your father and you respect the wisdom that he's instilled in you over the course of your entire lifetime, you know, maybe you'll hear your dad's voice when you're making these decisions and you'll make smarter choices because he wasn't just, you know, erring on the side of, I just want you to focus on this one choice. You had a father who gave you both perspectives and said, look, you, you could go this way with this decision and this would be your outcome or you could go this way with this decision and this would be your outcome. And, you know, as you follow the path of outcomes and decisions, you know, over the course of maybe years, you really, really begin to see how they affect your destiny. And that's why, you know, we, we love that quote. It's in your moments of decision that your destiny is shaped because it's a hundred percent true and it starts with the micro. And so, 
I think that's, that's what I'm training him to do is just make decisions on a micro level, um, make good choices, dietary included, so that as he gets older, you know, he is conscious of how to make decisions and which ones will lead to great outcomes and which ones will lead to poor outcomes. And so I give him the examples of people who made poor decisions and how it has affected their lives on a macro level, you know, even like my childhood friends, things like that. Like I, I want him to know like, Hey, I had this friend made these decisions, ended up here. This is what he's doing. Fast forward, you know, 20 years, 30 years later, I had this friend that made these decisions fast forward that guy's life 20, 25 years later, and he's here and he gets out in another 10 years, <laughs> you know? And, uh, it's, uh, I think that when they have perspective, it really helps. So that that's, you know, what I'm looking for at 18. So one of my coaches said to me something, he said, I want to teach my kids how to uh, <clears throat> run businesses, not ruin bank accounts. Yeah. Financially, that's another, I think, value. So <laughs> they're, they're, they're financially successful and he's got, you know, he, his boy is a, a little bit older than yours and he's got a daughter. His daughter is about your age. His boy's probably 11, 12, maybe 13 now. And he said a lot of the same things. He said, um, you know, I, I, never, I never want my kids to think that they have it made. Um, I want to mm -hmm. teach them how to make decisions. I want to put them in the boardroom with me when I'm doing a hard deal. I want to share with them the consequences of my, and, and they might not see what I see as a consequence as a negative. So maybe what I see as a negative, they're like, well, dad, what's the big deal? Like this isn't bad, you know? And we, we talk about it and we go over what's right and what's wrong. And, you know, we go over right. there. Um, and I, and I, you know, I think the, I think the parenting lesson is actually a leadership lesson. 100%. Where instead of telling your team what to do, you share with them, hey, if we do this, what are the different consequences? What can happen? What good, what bad? And, you know, obviously they're not sick, so they, they can think and they can come up with their own ideas. So you can go to a whiteboard and you just start throwing out the ideas. You know, if we do this, this these are all the positives. These are all the negatives, right? What else? What else? What else? And you can take that same six-year-old conversation where it's like, hey, you know, I don't know what you learn when you're not with me, son, but when you're with me, you know, these are the conversations we have. And here's what I, you know, you shared with him a vision. You mm -hmm. shared with him your vision of where you want him to be with his decision-making process. But you didn't say, son, I want you to be a firefighter. I want you to be an engineer. I want you to be a you know, a doctor or a surgeon, it's like, no, I just want you to make great decisions your whole life. Like if you can make That's great right. decisions your whole life, how much easier does your life become when you don't, I mean, dude, I've made a lot of really stupid ass decisions. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> a lot of stupid ass decisions. I mean, I, how, how am I alive? I don't even know. I mean, I'm talking some stupid shit. Yeah, we've had conversations about our, you know, we both were like, literally one cut away from being expelled from school you know we were always in trouble like not in trouble but like you know you weren't the good kid you, you right. weren't the kid that they're gonna bring on stage and be like wow this is Vikram the great little Indian boy that never has missed a day of school and we're just so proud of his straight A pluses no, I was like the kid that sold weed and you know god knows what else and we you know we're, we're just uh, that's just who who we are. Well, and, and I'll tell you, it, it's funny because sometimes the universe has greater plans for you, you know, so speaking of a story that I kind of like sharing the story, you know, theoretically it should have some embarrassment in it, but I, I do like it because it changed my life. Um, when I was, and I think I was about 18 years old, I was uh, hired to be kind of like I guess I was like a, a daycare maintenance guy slash after after school kids teacher. So like the first part of the day, you know, what it really was, they didn't really have a lot of work for me. And so they were like, you know, you can mop the halls, you can do this or that. And then um, we'll, uh, we'll have you, you know, clean up the school and do these routine tasks. You go to lunch, 
you come back and then shortly after, you know, I think it was about one o'clock, you get the after school kids, which for the most part were like second and third graders. Um, so that was my job, just to put it in perspective. I was just out of high school. Um, I was still, you know, that, that bad kid. But when I was at my job, you know, just realistically, I turned on the highest level of responsibility that I had in me. <laughs> so so I, would, I would turn on the responsibility and do my best there. It was, you know, it was definitely half measure responsibility, made some poor decisions, you know, even within that job. But um, the, the story is that I just got paid one day and I had no intention of going into the army. I, I kind of did, but it was just a dabbling thought. Like it may never have even become a reality. So I got paid one day. I had about $600 cash in my wallet. Somehow I ended up at a Walmart. <laughs> and uh, I remember I had just gotten a stun gun. I had, you know, and, and at that age, it was like 90% not for self protection. It was just like enjoyment. It was like maybe zap my friends. It was just a toy. Yeah. And, and, and you what know, boys do when they're 18 and bored, they buy weapons to hurt each other with. <laughs> right. So, so I have this stun gun. I'm excited about using it. And this was my mindset, right? So it just goes into just a macro view of ridiculousness of, you know, where your mind is, you know, at least where my mind was at 18 versus where it's at now at 39. Um, so I go into a Walmart, 600 bucks in my wallet. And I, um, I look at some Duracell Ultra batteries, nine volt. I need two of them to get my stun gun to work. And it turns out um, they're like seven ninety nine. <laughs> you know, they're, they're something like seven to $8. And so I look at it and I, I still remember what I thought because I had to ask myself probably over and over, why did you do that? But I, I remember thinking they're seven ninety nine. Another thought that went through my head is Walmart has plenty of money and I'm scarcity mentality. I only have $600. I don't know if that exact thought went through my head, but that was, that was my ration. You know, my rationale was I don't have as much money as Walmart. So Walmart can take the loss and it's probably no big deal if I steal these batteries. So I, I because Walmart was economically doing much better than me, I was justified in stealing batteries. So I steal these batteries. Well, I try. I put them in. I put them in my pocket. You know, whatever that day. I'm walking out the door, and a large African American security guard by the name of Marcus grabs me, <laughs> and and uh, I was so stunned. You know, and, and uh, I was probably smoking weed back then you know, at that that exact moment too. So <laughs> I was probably you know just not in a mindset of, you know, running or anything like, I just absolutely did not intend to get caught, expect it, you know, it wasn't my first time. And um, so it was a big surprise. And so Marcus grabs me and, you know, I knew what was happening, um, but, you know, it just, I just let it happen, right? I, I didn't run or anything like that. And um, so he takes me to the back of the store and uh, he tells me at that point, you know, hey, if you'd have run, I probably wouldn't have run, run after you. <laughs> so I'm like, hey, thanks for telling me. Um, he, ended, he ended up being, you know, a pretty cool guy looking back. But the funniest things, you know, that, that I remember about that encounter in, in the back room where they take shoplifters is one, he said, it never really surprises me who I catch, you know, stealing. I've caught full bird kernels. I've caught, you know, he started telling me the handful of people that he's caught stealing, you know? So like, what does a smuggler look like? I don't, it looks like anybody. Same with shoplifter, right? And so um, he says, um, do me a favor and empty out the contents of your wallet. So I do, I count out 600 bucks or so, give or take. He starts laughing. It's like, oh my God, like you could have bought 50 packs of this battery, like with what you have in your wallet. And he's like, you know, so I'm sure we talked a little bit more, but that was one of the questions. And then the other one was, what do you do for a living? I said, well, I'm, I'm a daycare teacher. And then he just started laughing again. And maybe that was where, you know, we started talking about the occupations that some of his shoplifting, you know, uh, people, perpetrators have had. And so um, all that really happens, you know, as he takes me to the front, 
I think it was like a display of like catching a shoplifter, we're embarrassing you. So hopefully you never do this again. You learn your lesson. Um, nobody I knew, I don't think, you know, saw me, even though I was on the lookout, I'm sure, because you're really concerned <laughs> about, you know, your reputation when you're, or your identity when you're that young. And even just getting caught would have been <laughs> um, a, a blow to my ego at the time. But um, so he takes me out to a police car and they give me a ticket. Like that's all they do. I stole like $7 worth of, you know, a good. And so they give me a ticket for theft under 50. And I didn't know what was going to happen. I was like, well, what, what do they do? They're not going to like take me to jail, right? Like there's not enough room in the jails for people that steal sticks of gum. And so, <laughs> so they, they, they give me the ticket and, and I'm, I'm really, you know, I, I remember the emotion that I had. It was embarrassment. I was embarrassed because at 18, based on my blueprint at the time, I felt that getting caught shoplifting was beneath me. Like how embarrassing, you know, I should know better. So the, the thug or the criminal, you know, the guy that like did bad in me was embarrassed because I'm not as good as I thought I was. And then the part of my identity that was like, you know, more of a macro identity, like as a person, am I going down the right path? That part was just ashamed, embarrassed, and and it was like a slap in the face that, you know, hey, if if it weren't obvious before, now I'm the universe letting you know that you're headed down a really ridiculous direction, you know, that, that's not gonna take you anywhere that you wanna go. So I went home that day and rather than fight, you know, my future and, and try to justify that, you know, it wasn't gonna happen again or, you know, I'm sorry or anything else. I went home and I told my parents, you know, pretty quick what happened. And then I told them. Yeah, um, I would have got beat to pulp. Maybe not beat, but yeah. I've been scared of being beat. Yeah. And I, I don't know what my parents would have done if I didn't have my follow on consequence, you know, theoretically, I guess you could say. And so I said, like, I'm going to tell you something, but I'm also going to back it with the decision that I made, you know, and then you just tell me what you think. But I was like, I'm really embarrassed. This is literally me telling my parents, I'm really embarrassed that I was in Walmart and I stole these batteries and I got caught and I got a ticket. And, and then I just literally kind of followed that on with, but honestly, because I was so embarrassed for what I did, I decided that the first thing tomorrow, I'm going to go talk to the army recruiter that I've kind of been talking to, but never really done anything with. And I'm just going to go tell him that I'm ready to sign and I want to go try to be an airborne ranger. Cause he said he could get that into my contract. And so, you know, I'm ready to sign up at least to go into the military. And so my parents, you know, both military people, my mom was ex air force, my dad ex army. Um, my mom now is like 69. My dad's about 75. They were like, okay. You know, it, like we couldn't have come up with a better consequence, whether you want to call that a consequence or, you know, right. like positive or negative, like we couldn't have come up with a better way to like deal with this problem. I think that's probably what went through their head. Right. And so they're like, okay, like let's let the kid go. And, you know, if, if within 24 hours he's signing up to go into the army, like, I guess we'll just roll with that. And so <laughs> I, I tell that story because, you know, it was just one stupid decision that a kid made that sent me on a path <clears> that <throat> just truly changed my life because if i if i wouldn't have done that you know i would have um i would have been living a totally different life you know right now that that changed my standards it changed the way i looked at the world it you know made me grow up and uh it was an amazing experience some good some bad but i wouldn't be the man i am now had i not experienced that between 19 and 23 years old so some things just happen the way that they're supposed to, you know, and, and that's how I've started looking at my life at 39 is just, you know, you do the best you can with the information and resources you have, but life will happen for you the way that it's supposed to. And that was a great example of that. And that was before I knew anything about Tony. I mean, I saw him on infomercials back then, but never really like was interested in in you know mentorship with with him <laughs> so so it, it just goes to show you that principle is valid whether or not you're a part of self-development ecosystem or, or not you know well it's funny you know 
for one, thanks for sharing that story. Um, it, it, you know, you say that it was a mistake. However, it doesn't appear that it was actually a mistake. It's no. exactly where you were at in life. You had the exact tools that you had been given. It's one of the reasons why schools scare me so much with young kids is because they don't get taught how to manifest. They don't get taught how to quiet the mind. They don't get taught with how to make a tough decision. They don't get taught with what do you do when you know, you're faced with A and B and you know that the B consequence is going to be bad, but you're, there's something that tells you, know, we, don't, we don't get taught the, the tricks that the mind is able to play. Right. right. So we, we go through life just, you know, doing the best that we can. And our parents were never taught that their parents were never taught that, you know, maybe 5% of the population, 10% of the population knows these things and teaches it to people. I'd say a lot more people know it, but the amount of people who teach it effectively, it, it's a, such a small number, right? So you, you made a mistake. That mistake ended up sending you down you know, a four or five year rabbit hole where you were able to <laughs> really get your shit together, get some discipline, figure out some things. Uh, but, I, you know, you, you say that maybe you, you're talking about how everything work, everything happens for you. Well, yeah, I mean, that's how life should, everybody is, we're all too busy being victims to be victors. Everybody's out there right now in this, in this economy Oh, Donald did this. Oh, Biden did. Oh, they did. Oh, that. What the fuck did you do? What did you do? Yeah. Well, I, well, uh, uh, well, uh, what, what, what did you do to contribute to anything? Nothing. So shut the, get off the, you're not even on the bench. <laughs> you're not even, you're not even on right. the, you're, you're, you're not even in the stands. You're, you're not even watching the game right now. Like, how do you have an opinion on the game that you don't even watch and you don't even know? It's like you're giving input about cricket and you've never seen the sport. And the world that we live in right now is, you know, it's very judgmental um, and it's very, 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 very quick to be the victim. And if you're the victim, then everything is happening to you and you have zero power to change it. But when you're the victor, then everything is happening for you and you have tremendous ability to change everything. You have all the power in the world to make your reality whatever you want it to be. So when you're the victor, then you can make reality happen. But when you're the victim, you just sit back and wait for people to take advantage of you. And then when they do, your self-fulfilling prophecy comes true that, see, everything bad happens to me. I'm not lucky like you guys. You, you <laughs> guys are just so positive and, and, and happy-go-lucky. Well, I can tell you there's a lot of things in my life that's, that I could easily say this happened to me but it all happens for you. Um, yeah. Real quick, man. I, I know we're getting close to our time. Uh, we're actually slightly over our time here. Um, what's the one impact you want to have before you die? You know, I, I think the biggest thing, because I, I don't want to tie a bunch of expectations to my death and legacy either, you know, because uh, it's like I, I do on one hand, but I don't want to stress, you know, about it. Right. So I think, you know, just taking it one day at a time um, as of right now, um, I want a, a part of me sometimes thinks about, you know, how many people, if I died today, would show up, you know, would go out of their way to show up at my funeral. Right. Um, and how many people would just be like, you know, maybe scrolling through Facebook. Yeah, or I think we talked and, about that. And that, like, that's it, that. you know, like, oh, he died. That's it. Like, so, so I think, you know, as I progress, I never really thought about that. But, you know, I, I guess my, my goal would be to, to have the, the largest number of people possible show up at my funeral. And it wouldn't be because of the ego of having a big funeral and, and wanting, you know, the, the largest group of people it would just be because that would be my measure of knowing how many lives I impacted. You know, I'd like to be one of those people that just has this never ending line of people wanting to talk about, you know, Hey, there was this 
this thing that happened and this is what Brayson did for me and you know this is how I feel about him and if I if I could create a situation where at my ceremony you know whether they all got to talk or not would be a different story but um, just that there that there was this never-ending line of testimonials for how significant of an impact I had or how I affected positive, you know, change on their life. I think, I think that would be, that would be it. You know, um, if I, if I can change the world and, and, you know, create that macro level of an impact on an industry or something like that, I think that would be really cool. Um, but at the same time, you know, just, just on a, on a, I don't know, quasi moderate level of expectation, that would be my goal, you know, and, and I'd like to be somebody that my son and, and family, you know, and, and surviving family could be proud of, uh, my grandchildren could be proud of, and, and talk about with, you know, some level of reverence, you know, like granddad did this. <laughs> right. um, I, I think that would be, that would be just nice, you know, so I, I'm hoping that I can uh, leave, you know, some positivity and, and some positive change with anyone who comes in contact with me. And if it's at that high level, you know, that's one of the things I admire the most about anybody that lives a life where wherever they go, people come up to them and say, Oh man, you changed my life. Like, wow. You know, what a, what a dopamine hit that must be every time that somebody says that, you know? Uh, and you're like, wow, really? You're in Argentina. Like <laughs> I can't even it's much better than believe. a lump of cocaine. Yeah, like I can't even believe I'm affecting people in Argentina, but you know, it's, it's great funny. to have love here. So, well, so yeah. Favorite book? My favorite book, man, it's probably be a boring book. Um, it's okay. I, I like I, I like principles, you know, principles yeah. by Ray Dalio. I just think it's super useful, you know. Super it's, useful. I think it's you know yeah it's 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 dry. It could be considered dry. It's like but 600 I mean, pages, man. It's, it's a, it's, it's not, it's not a book you read for entertainment. It's a book you read to, to let you life handbook. And ponder the world. Yeah. It, it's a life handbook. And if you can get past, you know, like just the complexity that, that, you know, might sound intimidating. I think Dalio is actually pretty, a pretty he's a, yeah, he's, he's, he tries to write in a way that, you know, anybody can understand it. And I think most people don't want to read 600 pages, but man, it, it's just, yeah, it's a life handbook and yeah. it just has simple formulas in it. You know, like yeah. our arguing with reality is a recipe for, you know, <laughs> difficulty. <laughs> I mean, like that's the type of lessons that you glean from this guy's words. And, and um, it sounds simple, but I've, I've had, bouts with reality you know like i wanted to challenge reality Every the day. reality of of my situation whatever and I, I wanted to like pretend it wasn't there or right. go to sleep and then hopefully i wake up and my reality's different and i'll feel different about this and um you know i'm like wow he, he could have changed my, my mindset in a day by just giving me that life hack that hey, when reality comes it's nothing to be feared you know, you need to like learn to deal with it. And exactly. you know, that that's how mastery, that's how life mastery happens. It's the people who are the best at negotiating the obstacles that come with living in our day-to-day -day reality and then making the best decisions, you know, based on the environment that they encounter, you know? So, uh, yeah, I think I, I would say principles definitely way up there. Um, I'm sure I have others, but but that's a strong one. Uh, I don't I, I, I don't think you go wrong with principles ever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Where can people find you? Um, well, Facebook's probably where I'm I'm most found uh, found most easily. It's just you know I I have everything set on public. I've I kind of took that on years ago. I said you know why uh if i'm willing to put it on facebook why not just you know make it global or public so uh regardless of the consequences that comes with um bryson verzella just the way you have it spelt here is uh easiest way to find me is on facebook um people can dm me uh, like you said i run digital investor uh mastermind digital investor io which we have 
about 370 people now. And you guys and, put a lot of information on there. I mean, I, I, I don't follow yeah. it as much as I should, but you guys have a lot of content and a lot of good information. Yeah. And so anybody yeah, we're just, in the digital space should definitely look into that group on Facebook. Yeah, we're just, we're, we're building, we're going to roll out, you know, a handful of uh, different, you know, things on there to help people out. And then some people just want to go and I tell them like, there's so many different places to get cryptocurrency information. So if you're into dig digital investment, you know, if I'm just 5% of where you get your information, that Facebook group, that's cool. We have a discord chat for people that want to take it to the next level trading um, or, you know, want to be involved on a daily basis. But but yeah, if they just want, you know, free, I would say good, you know, clean, real content, um, that that mastermind's actually a pretty good, pretty good place to, to pick up things. And if I see something that is not true, or if I, you know, if I were to see somebody trying to scam somebody, ask for money or ask for anything, um, you know, we want to get rid of that sort of thing because we want a good, clean place for people to, to be able to go and, and not have a negative experience, which is fairly common in the cryptocurrency industry. Yeah, you want to keep it a safe environment where people aren't getting scammed left and right. Yeah, or safe, join ethical. This, join this thing and that you'll have all this digital currency and then that you join it and it's out like 500 bucks and the guy- Right, right. And if you, if you invest in something like, you know, we want to make it really clear, like this is extreme high risk, but you know, we're putting this out there. We have nothing to do with it. Um, if I make trades, you know, sometimes I'll publicize trades. If it's just experimental, uh, I'm working on a, uh, an al algorithm, you know, basically putting something together with an algorithm and bots. And, you know, so some of what I'm doing is just very experimental. I throw it out there. I say, this is, you know, where we're at, where we entered this trade. And then, you know, maybe 10 days from now, I'll show you how it turned out. If you, you know, open a position based on this, everything you did was on you. You know, this is not a trade call. If you, if you <clears throat> succeed, it was on you. It was a risk you took. If you fail, it's on you. Yeah. It's a risk you took. Um, so yeah, we just try to be really transparent, which I think is just, that's probably the biggest thing missing from a lot of groups in the cryptocurrency space. A lot of people just want to say, buy Z coin. Cause it's, you know, the best. <laughs> and there's a lot wrong with that. <laughs> totally, man. Well, brother, I definitely enjoyed catching up with you. I know we tried to jump on this a few times over the last couple of weeks. So the universe yeah. finally allowed us to make it happen. Um, Absolutely. And uh, I'm super pumped. And I hope that everybody watching, you guys got some great value. Uh, Brayson's a great guy to know. He's definitely a, a person who's full of heart, full of wisdom. Um, he's been through a lot of trials and tribulations in his life. And I'm sure... Uh, they're not done yet. And so go find him on Facebook, reach out to him, say hello. Um, cause he's always, uh, he's always got kind, wise words. My brother, thank you so much. Appreciate it, man. Thanks for the opportunity. And, uh, yeah, like I said, I'm just, uh, I'm wanting to get comfortable, you know, doing podcasts and having open discussions like this. So uh, it's, it's actually like some nice therapy. <laughs> <laughs> and, if we help, and, if we, and if we help some people along the way, then that's great too. Yeah. It, you know, it, for me, it's like people are like, oh, why do you do this stuff? I'm like, because I got to get shit out of my head. And if yeah. I get out of my head, I feel better. So maybe it'll help you get your shit out of your head. So cool, man. Well, yeah. I will chat with you later, brother. Have a great day. All right. Sounds good, man. Take care. Bye-bye.